Everybody knows bees. They like flowers. But actually, this is not a bee. This is a fly. And everybody knows that bees like to ruin picnics. But actually, these aren't bees either. They're yellow jacket wasps, the bees that land on your food. Okay, I promise this time. These are bees. They're European honeybees. They're raised by big keeper, beekeepers in big hives, and they make honey. Now, you may have heard that the honeybees are in decline, that we need to save the honeybees. But actually, that's not true either. Honeybees never have been, nor ever will be, threatened with extinction. Instead, the bees we need to worry about are our native bees. The more than 4,000 species that live wild without beekeepers in our meadows, our forests, our dunes, even our backyards. Our wild bees are in serious trouble because we've made the environments in which they live less hospitable. In the last 20 years, several species abundant in the city have vanished with no sign of return. In contrast, there's more than 2.6 million hives of honeybees in the US today, each with 30 to 50,000 workers. It's the native bees, not the honeybees, we need to save. But how did we get to this point where the honeybee, which doesn't need saving, became the face of Save the Bees? Well, honeybees are not native to North America. They were brought over by colonists in the 1600s, and now we manage them on an industrial scale for crop pollination. Every year, millions of hives are strapped to the backs of semi-tractor trailers and shipped all around. California almonds in February, Washington apples in April, Nebraska sunflowers in July. We've managed to rest our entire food system on the shoulders of a single, shoulderless insect. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Well, in 2006, colony collapse disorder struck. Beekeepers were doing routine checks of their hives, and they noticed a little bit of a problem. All the bees were missing. <laughs> Naturally, panic spread through the media like wildfire, and people started exclaiming that without the honeybee, the end of the world was nigh. But then, just like that, colony collapse disorder disappeared, and it hasn't been seen since. And our honeybees, well, they're doing just fine. But unfortunately, the damage was done because over the next 15 years, Save the Honeybee was vaulted into the global spotlight. Companies like General Mills and Whole Foods, celebrities like Angelina Jolie, Morgan Freeman, even groups like the Sierra Club and Greenpeace spread misinformation, proclaiming that their work saving honeybees was tackling one of the most pressing environmental issues facing humanity. Don't believe any of it. All of it is greenwashing but with bees. Call it bee washing. <laughs> honeybees are not an environmental issue because honeybees are not wild animals. They are livestock, non-native livestock that spread disease and outcompete our native biodiversity. You know, and we, we're never gonna be want for honeybees because we can always raise more of them. And in this way, raising honeybees to save the bees is about as backwards as raising chickens to save songbirds. But remember, there are still bees that need saving, our native bees, and they are absolutely enchanting. They come in every size, shape, and color you can imagine. Reds, blues, greens, some bigger than rigatoni, others smaller than orzo. <laughs> our native bees don't live like honeybees either. They don't live in hives or make honey. The vast majority of them are solitary, meaning each female builds her nest on her own without workers. And because there's no society to protect, you guys will love this. Our native bees are incredibly gentle. They don't sting. And if you thought our honeybees were the only ones that could pollinate our crops, well, you'd be mistaken because our native bees, they are the best in the business. They've evolved alongside our crops like blueberries and cranberries and sunflowers and apples for millions of years, and so they speak that language. In contrast, honeybees have only been around for a few hundred years in the United States, and the best part about our native bees is they do all of that pollinating for free. But the benefits we get from our native bees, all of it is at risk. We've launched a volley of threats at them. Pesticides, climate change, habitat loss, the big three. Disease, pollution, lawns, agriculture, even competition from honeybees, a single hive of which can steal the resources needed by 100,000 native bees. So what have we done to combat some of these threats? Well, largely conservation is focused on planting flowers, which is food for bees, in our rural and natural areas. But recently, a new frontier has emerged. Cities, the fastest growing land use type around the world, actually is compatible with native bee conservation. 
This is in part because our cities are chock full of native bees. Hundreds of species can make a living with inside urban limits. And the key to keeping them around is for the other inhabitants, all of you, to be willing to share a little bit of your land with our pollinator neighbors. Over the last eight years or so, I've done a lot of work raising awareness in my community for the plight of native bees. And if there's one thing I've learned, it's that people protect what they care about, but they really only care about what they know. So as a bee scientist, I've gotten to know our native bees quite well, and I'd like to share some of their stories with you with the hopes that it'll inspire you to go out and meet them yourselves this year. You likely already know one of them. Bumblebees, they're fuzzy, charismatic, and incredibly common. You can meet them on almost any flower on the street. Now, bumblebees are there because in spring, a queen emerged, and she started a colony in an old rodent's burrow. And she produced workers, all females, which were tasked with getting food to grow the colony. On flowers, bumblebees do an amazing thing called buzz pollination. They sing at the right frequency, and from the flowers just cascades pollen like snow. Now, buzz pollination is really important for some of the foods we love, like chili peppers and eggplants and tomatoes. But honeybees don't know how to do it. And so every jar of tomato sauce you've ladled over spaghetti, every packet of ketchup on a Fenway Frank, has been made possible by a bumblebee, a native bee. Then in the fall, when the colony is big enough, they produce new queens, which tuck under some leaves to spend the winter and emerge next spring to complete the cycle. And from this, we learn that our native bees really don't ask us for all that much. They need a spot to build a nest, some food from flowers, and some quiet R&R for the winter. Unlike bumblebees, most of our native bees are solitary, meaning each female does all the work in the nest without workers, all the egg laying, the nest building, the foraging. In a few weeks' time, cellophane bees are going to emerge down at the lakeshore or in a cemetery, and they have one thing on their mind, the birds and the bees. <laughs> the males and the females tussle and toil across the ground in these wild, lust-fueled mating balls. But then the romance is over, and the females kick the males out of the picture, because in the bee world, males don't help around the house. <laughs> females find nice, sandy spots to build homes, typically in the company of other females. They form these neighborhoods, consisting of hundreds to thousands of nests, each of which looks like a mini volcano on the surface. But underground, it extends one to two feet in length, and it contains a series of chambers known as brood cells, which the female constructs to house her babies. She first somersaults her body to excavate a jelly bean-sized cavity. Then, to make it even cozier, she takes her spit, and she smears it along the inside walls to create a natural, waterproof lining akin to cellophane. Then it's time to go to the grocery store, and she flies to flowers, maple trees, apple trees, to collect nutritious pollen and nectar to fill the brood cells. She lays her eggs, and then she dies. And over the summer, her offspring will develop underground, out of sight, until next spring, when the trees are in flower again. Other bees are a bit pickier about the food they like, and so to see them, you have to go out at different times of year. Take the squash bee, for example, which only eats squash pollen, and so to find them, you have to be in a vegetable garden in summer. Early in the morning, the males ricochet from flower to flower, looking for mates, while the females dodge the overzealous males and pack pollen into long hairs on their legs. At noon, when it's hot out, the flowers close and the females are done for the day. But the males, well, you know, they're not welcome in the nest, and so they have to find an alternative place to take a nap. As it turns out, they love sleeping inside the flowers. And so next summer, go out into your garden, peel open that zucchini flower, and peer inside, and you'll find yourself face to face with a male squash bee. Now don't worry, this is an incredibly safe venture. No male bees can sting. Their only crime is being way too adorable. <laughs> but it's not all fun and games in the pumpkin patch because a predator is lurking, a cuckoo bee. With mama squash bee out of the nest, the cuckoo bee seizes her chance. She slips into the nest, lays an egg in a brood cell, and slips out undetected. When mama squash bee comes back, she is oblivious to what has just transpired, and she goes on her merry way, sealing up the nest. But inside, she's locked a killer. 
The cuckoo bee egg hatches into a larva with huge jaws, and it just slices that defenseless squash bee in half. And from this nest next year, a cuckoo bee is going to emerge. Now I know what you're saying, screw the cuckoo bee because we like squash bees and we like pumpkins on Halloween. But don't malign the cuckoo bee because they are as important of a part of our local biodiversity as the squash bee. And the only reason they're here is because there's enough squash bees to go around. Nevertheless, karma does have a way of finding its way into the bee world. And this cuckoo bee got nabbed by a crab spider camouflaged on a flower. I'd like to take a step back for a moment, because when we plant squash, not only do we feed squash bees, which help feed us, but those squash bees feed cuckoo bees, and those cuckoo bees feed crab spiders, and those crab spiders feed mockingbirds, and so on and so forth. This simple, relatively benign act of planting some food has brought forth and sustained this wondrous, rich web of biodiversity, all in our backyards. So what can we do to keep them around? Well, there's still a lot we have to learn about our native bees, but we do know enough to act now. I call it use seeds. That's S-E-E-D-S. -E -E S stands for spread native flowers. Because when we plant the flowers the bees are used to, they've evolved alongside with, that's what makes them happiest. Any amount helps, a meadow with goldenrods and asters, a little patch in your backyard with black-eyed Susans and mountain mint, even a single sunflower in a pot on your balcony makes a difference. E stands for employ a life cycle approach. When we plant flowers, we support adults, but 90% of the life cycle takes place in the nest, out of sight. But it can't be out of mind. So refrain from mowing your lawn as much, or leave a bare patch of soil or stems standing in your garden. And to help those bumblebee queens, hashtag leave the leaves. E stands for eliminate pesticides. It's really quite simple. What kills a mosquito, what kills a tick, kills a bee. So get out and vote in your local governments to restrict pesticide use on residential and commercial and municipal lands. D stands for discover what's around you. This is my favorite part. Go out and watch bees. Don't be afraid, they're incredibly gentle. And if you get down to the level of the flower and look a bee in an eye, you'll notice they have personalities and quirks. And you're gonna wanna keep them around. As poet Mary Oliver puts it, attention is the beginning of devotion. S stands for share with others. To save our native bees, it takes a hive. So take what you learned today, take what you learn on your own, and tell it to others. Be a pollinator ambassador in your local community and inspire others to make a difference as well. In other words, be a change. <laughs> oh. Oh. Okay. I would like to leave you with a final takeaway. And that's if you want to save bees, but you're not quite sure how to begin or you, you forget seeds, don't just default to raising honeybees. It might be tempting to put a hive on your roof or a hive in your backyard, but for the last time, our honeybees don't need saving. To remember what to do to help our native bees, I'm going to encourage you to find some flowers and introduce yourself to your native bee neighbors. They're already there, They've always been there, living in plain sight. Because when we slow down and we pay attention and we listen carefully to the stories they have to tell us, we can be reminded of the things we can all do to help. It's not big things, it's small, intentional, respectful acts, like planting their favorite flowers throughout the year or telling the pesticide company, you know what, we're not interested, we like the bees or teaching a child that bees should be revered and not feared. Which means at the end of the day, each and every one of us has the agency to keep our meadows and our forests and our dunes and our backyards full of cloudy-winged mining bees and pugnacious leafcutter bees, two-spotted longhorn bees, and bicolored striped sweat bees, hibiscus turret bees, and orange-tipped wood digger bees, see, I couldn't, I couldn't let this go un unmentioned, uh, aster mining bees, and denticulate longhorn bees, and golden northern bumblebees, all of whom are our fuzzy-winged neighbors, which can, in return, enrich our lives 
and nourish our bodies and our minds and our souls and help us grow a more sustainable future. Thank you.